Thank you very much, and uh, particularly uh, Jennifer and Aaron for uh, having me or letting me participate in this. Uh, in addition to myself, I have to acknowledge the others that have been a uh, participant of the work we're doing there at Cahokia that re relates to the G uh, uh, GIS work. Uh, Kathleen Stallman, who's here today, uh, uh, Davide Domenici, and Emma uh, Belize from the University of Bologna, and I'll, I'll talk about that. This is more of a historical overview of the kind of work that's been going on at Cahokia way back into the 19th century. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a historical overview and then give you some examples of uh, uh, several projects uh, that involve, uh, um, at an elementary level, some of the potential GIS work that hopefully we'll be able to take it to the next step in the future. What you're looking at th uh, there is an aerial or a, uh, an oblique shot taken by a colleague at St. Charles Community College back about five years ago, about this time, or back in October. Uh, the lower half of that, you can see St. Louis in the background. Uh, you see some white above my name. You see some white buildings. From there south, that represents uh, a portion of Cokie Mountains. It covers about um, uh, 14 square kilometers. Uh, and then under Kathleen's name, unfortunately, got hidden is Monk's Mound, which most of you are probably familiar if, with if you've been to the site. And then those shaded uh, light green areas are the four plazas. This makes up the epicenter of this uh, urban center. It's about a kilometer and a half from the southern edge, uh, south is to the left, uh, all the way up to the northern edge, uh, and then about a little over a kilometer east-west. So it's a major, uh, major focus of the work that we're doing. Uh, I want to start with a little bit of, of indigenous GIS work. Uh, the upper map is a map produced by a Catawba Indian, I believe a Catawba chief in the uh, late 18th century. Uh, the, the town of Charleston, uh, South Carolina is on the left. The Catawba live in, in South Carolina today and that's where their home was when they were encountered by the Spaniards. And those other circles represent other tribal entities that this tribal uh, tree tried to convey in this format to the officials in Charleston. So that if you look closely, you'd see these various Aboriginal tribe names in there. Uh, the lower slide could very well be an even older map. We don't know, and we'll probably never know, but it shows up in, on, on some marine shell welts uh, at the spiral site in uh, eastern Oklahoma. Um, and we suspect even those whelps may have been engraved at Cahokia. These were a, a big mortuary complex that was uh, uh, partially destroyed in the 1930s and then later archaeologists were able to intervene and salvage what they could. But you can see the circles very much like that and then the connecting lines. So, of course, we can only speculate about uh, what may have been going on. Um, for the area here uh, in St. Louis, uh, this is one of the earliest maps in the 18th century by a Frenchman, Collot. Uh, he has placed on there, uh, the actual map runs all the way from St. Charles, which would be off the map to the right, all the way down to New Madrid, Missouri. Uh, so this is a, a, the upper section of that. Uh, and you can see the group of mounds that we know as a poulture site near Dupo, Illinois. And then, and why a Frenchman would have misspelled uh, St. Louis, I don't know. Perhaps he had an English cartographer doing the inking, or he didn't really like the uh, uh, Louis, the, uh, whichever the Louis it was. Cahokia Mounds is not represented on there. Uh, it would have been just south on the, on the uh, in that open area that you see there, uh, would have been where it was located. It was not that it wasn't known, uh, but these were along the trails uh, that went all the way from uh, New Madrid, all the way up to St. Louis, and then on to St. Charles in the late 18th century. Uh, one of the uses of maps uh, was by the uh, Smithsonian Institution back in the uh, 1880s when they did a study of uh, trying to debunk a myth, and I won't go into the myth, uh, but a myth that had emerged uh, in the late 18th and well into the 19th century that the mounds were built by a separate race of people. They weren't made by American Indians. And so part of this was to, to really provide the data. And so the Smithsonian Institution 
uh, with its mountain builder survey, uh, all the little red dots are all these mounds that were located at that time. And it included some surveys in the St. Louis area. Uh, these are the mounds that were mapped in St. Louis uh, by a local uh, antiquarian, uh, uh, McAdams, uh, who was from Alton. And you can see up at the top of the map, Alton, and then the Cokie Mounds there at the bottom, and there were mounds in East St. Louis as well. Uh, this is a modern, uh, recent version using GIS techniques on a Kathleen. Uh, pulled the data out of the Illinois Archaeological Survey and Missouri Archaeological Survey files and then the people at Heartlands Conservancy put it on a, on a base map. So they merged those two, those two data sets. The purple little dots that you see, there's over 500 mounds or sites represented with mounds, including Cahokia, which is just below the center there. It's part of an effort to preserve the remaining mounds in the St. In the St. Louis region, particularly the larger sites. Uh, in terms of the mapping of, of Cahokia, uh, just as a site, it goes back to the time shortly after the Civil War where uh, a local uh, dentist, uh, John Patrick, was involved in, in uh, seeing that the mounds at Cahokia, East St. Louis, and those down by Dupo were mapped. Uh, other maps were produced by those other individuals. Uh, an individual important in the preservation of Cahokia Mounds, Moorhead, who was an archaeologist uh, in the 20s, and then you can see the other various maps, and also the aerial photographs uh, that became available uh, in the 1920s and 30s and are up to today. Um, the first professional work, uh, or some of the first professional work after Moorhead was in 1950 by the University of Michigan, and they had their own maps. Patrick, uh, who was a dentist, uh, uh, worked with the uh, county surveyor in St. Char or in uh, St. Clair County to uh, to produce this map that you see of Cokie Mount. Uh, the maps, the original maps, are now at the Missouri History Museum. They're massive. Uh, probably the one for Cahokia would fit across this section of wall here, and they are available to. Uh, uh, if you're interested in them. And so uh, it's a relatively, for that time, an accurate map. And apparently there were notes that accompanied uh, the survey that he did, but we don't, uh, we don't know what happened to them. One of the maps that Patrick did was a, a, a Monk's Mound, the largest mound up in the upper left-hand corner. And we actually have a date on that. Uh, eventually other mounds were produced, for example, one of our colleagues, Mike Fowler, uh, uh, had this photogrammetric map done, it should have been in 1966, uh, uh, using aerial photographs with a local engineering company. Uh, and then the most recent map by Oates and Associate uh, related to some work on Monk's Mound was done with a total station in 2005. And now we have the LIDAR, various LIDAR uh, images that are available. So you get a sense of how things have changed and how visually uh, they're represented. Uh, Really professionally, in terms of looking at Cokie as a landscape and using uh, geophysical techniques and geoarchaeological techniques and, and merging it to some extent with GIS, was Renita Dolan, who was at SIU Edwardsville, who's now at Moorhead State University. So here you see them working on some uh, downhole sampling there at Cokie, and they produce that volume that you see uh, from a land, landscape perspective. I started back working at Cahokia in the early 90s. I had been there in the late 60s and then had worked elsewhere in the region. Um, and so that's when I started teaching here. Uh, one of the courses I taught was mapping. So uh, I would take students out. Uh, this is within the western limits of Cahokia, outside the park boundaries. And they'd learn to use a transit first because I thought that was important. And then eventually they got to use the total station. And so they, uh, over the last 20 years, uh, we, I think we've just about mapped every mound there at the site. Uh, and then come, along comes LIDAR. So uh, <laughs> uh, we nonetheless have some data, good data sets. This is one of the maps that was produced, uh, uh, systematically walking an area, piece plotting. You can barely see the little dots uh, that represent individual artifacts from the surface. Uh, the grid system represents a more intense occupation, which we collected the data in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, 10 meters square. So you can get a sense 
of beginning to map out the distribution of materials uh, at this, in this portion of the site. Uh, just north of that area, uh, we have a not-for-profit organization that ended up buying that tract of land, which is about a hectare. Uh, it was in cultivation. We did a series of collections. You can see the individual dots representing a particular artifact type re related to the production of shell beads. And then we had a colleague at the University of Illinois, Mike Hargrave, uh, who would add, add access to geophysical equipment, and in this case, uh, resistivity uh, equipment. And I've cheated a little bit because I've highlighted where the houses are. The dark anomalies represent house basins, and we have a colleague now at uh, St. Louis University, Mary Vermillion, who's been verifying those, uh, uh, those anomalies. They are indeed uh, all house basins that uh, that, uh, that Mike had identified in that geophysical work. So we're beginning to merge these things together uh, as we speak. Uh, the, the next project I want to just briefly talk about is the area to the east of Monk's Mound. And I don't know if I, I got a little, a little pointer. Yeah, there we go. So we're looking at this area. You can actually see the excavation here uh, this is the Palisade Wall. You can actually see it on the LiDAR map here. Uh, several, uh, several very subtle, uh, subtle uh, uh, visually several things show up that you can see when you're out in the field. One is this small platform, and actually I've pointed to it. If you look carefully, you can see there's a slight rise in the topography on the LiDAR map. We also see it topographically, not as well defined. And then we have a, a mound at the very edge of the embankment there. Uh, just north of that arrow, let me see if I can pick it up right here. It looks like another mound. The actual mound is right in here. And then we have something of a, of a, that we cannot see visually. So we've got to figure out what that's all about. But you can begin to see the uh, impact that LiDAR is going to have on our research as we begin to merge these different things together. This is a geophysical survey of that same tract of, of land. You can see the mound here at the bottom, just to the right of Monk's Mound. And then we have a very unusual anomaly that looks like another mound, but it's actually on the slope. So this is below uh, the surface of the uh, of the ground, so it's something that's underneath the mound. It's just the reverse. It may be uh, an intaglia of a mound with a with a ramp on it. The third and final project is that being done uh, by our colleagues from the University of Bologna. Uh, they are working to the west of Monk's Mound in an area that we refer to as the West Plaza. Uh, there were excavations uh, done on that area known as Sand Prairie Lane uh, in the early 1960s as they were building the interstate system through the site. Uh, and the Italians uh, are working just to the west of there. And what they've been able to do is georeference, that's the old excavations and maps of that on the right-hand side. Uh, and then they've taken and applied uh, the, the recent excavations that they're conducting. So they've georeferenced, they've actually scanned all the highway maps, they've scanned all the notes. Uh, in fact, when they first got here to the U.S., and they went up to Springfield, Illinois to scan the notes and maps and photographs, uh, the first thing they went and bought was an iPad uh, just after they came out. And so we'll be out in the field working on an area and they pull out their iPad and then all this information uh, is right available to us. So we don't have to go back up to the State Museum or look through a whole bunch of Xeroxes. So it's really changed our perspective. Uh, the other thing that they're doing, uh, the maps that they're creating here, they're very good at GIS, uh, is they uh, don't do the type of mapping that we do when we're mapping houses and, and uh, pits and burials and things like that, is that they uh, use a digital camera to take pictures and there you see a rod going up and there's a, a camera at the end of it and then they take pictures of the excavations and then they dump it into the computer and they have a software program that deals with the parallax and then they map right off the digital image. Now what they've done is they've taken uh, the iPad, they take the picture, not with a remote, remote control as they're starting to do here, but they take it with their iPad. So you stand out there, you can see the image as you're standing next to the pole, and then right uh, immediately you see what you're going to photograph. 
Uh, and then finally this summer, one of the young Italians, Marco Bruni, was given a nice present by, I think, his parents of a, uh, of a drone. I was to call it a drone. Uh, that he now that they're now using to fly over the site and, and take images of the excavations as well. And we were talking to uh, Aaron the other day about even using these to do lidar images. That that wouldn't that wouldn't work on that uh, uh, little creature there. So without further, uh, thank you very much.